everybody. Welcome to Hong Kong Institute of Arbitrators uh, webinar this evening. Um, we scheduled to begin at 6 p.m. and um, I was asked to give everybody a bit of time for coming in. So uh, I'll do the formal introduction of a speaker later on. Um, this is one of uh, a series of um, uh, training sessions that uh, Institute organized for our members. Uh, the, the, the primary objective of uh, providing up-to-date information on arbitration and other ADRs. And um, uh, tonight uh, we have, uh, and normally we are on very much uh, conventional topics on um, things that are happening or that has ha that have happened in our field. Now for tonight, we are very much look, going to look at the future and look at something uh, really innovative in Hong Kong and also with a worldly perspective. Um, and uh, I think by now we should have uh, most of those who have signed up at, uh, and logged in. So, right, uh, tonight's topic is uh, unleashing opportunities uh, from generative AI and uh, AALCO, ELCO, which is actually the short for Asian African Legal Consultative Organization. Um, well, for those who sign up uh, without knowing exactly what we are going to have, might um, wonder why AI and ELCO are put, will put together. Well, we'll wait for our speaker, uh, Mr. Nick Chen, whom I shall introduce right now. Uh, I hope everybody sees him. And indeed, uh, he is not unknown. I'm sure he's uh, well known in uh, the local legal community and also in a lot of other uh, public uh, areas. Uh, Mr. Chen is a, a recipient of Medal of Honor. Uh, he is Justice of the Peace the director leading the operations of ELCO, uh, Hong Kong Regional Arbitration Center. And uh, he, of course, in his, uh, his primary uh, 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 occupation is partner of an international law firm in Hong Kong. Now, um, I'm not going to read this uh, or nearly a thousand word bio of uh, Mr. Le uh, Mr. Chan, uh, but one thing that, uh, I'm sure every one of us, uh, many of us uh, are, are aware of it was uh, he was chairman of Ebram. And uh, I think I'm sure many of us are using the services provided by Ebram and uh, giving feedbacks to, to them. But in addition to that, uh, Mr. Chen is well known for his um, technology background. And this is where uh, I, AI comes in. Now, um, I shall not take up too much of uh, your time, and uh, I shall pass uh, the floor to Nick. And um, uh, Nick, welcome. Thank well, you, Dr. Ma, Jimmy. Uh, thank well, you, thank uh, you. Thank you for taking up this uh, uh, invitation. And indeed, um, a, a bit of uh, decorative interest here, because uh, not that uh, we are uh, uh, personal friends uh, in, our, in our personal capacities, and indeed, our, our two institutions, the Hong Kong Institute of Arbitrators and ELCO, uh, are going to uh, be more uh, active in the pursuing uh, the objectives of our respective institutions in Hong Kong. And uh, we, uh, I hope uh, members who have signed, signed up today will see more of us collaborating in the near future. Nick, here you are. Uh, this, this is your floor. Thank you very much. Thank Thank you, Dr. Ma. Thank you, friends of the Hong Kong Institute of Arbitrators. Uh, I am uh, a fellow member, um, as in I'm one of us. <laughs> uh, and uh, so, absolute pleasure. I, I can see the participants' names. I recognize many friends here uh, and uh, new friends that I hope to make from today. Uh, now, I'm going to share my screen. Hey, please hold on. Uh, so my, my background is in uh, computer science, um, focus in AI and law. Uh, so I, I, in university, those are the two degrees I, uh, I uh, undertook. Um, so it, I'm also uh, serving you um, at the National People's Congress as an elected member. This is my second term in office. Um, so 
as lawyers, as arbitrators, as dispute resolvers, uh, if you have suggestions on uh, how to uh, improve our standing uh, or our profession uh, and our, our opportunities, unleashing the opportunities uh, of Hong Kong as a dispute resolution hub and legal services center, um, please don't hesitate to educate me and together we could make this a, a bigger, uh, better place for everybody. Now, um, I, I, we want to talk about AI because it's making a lot of um, um, seismic changes to a lot of different uh, industries and professions. And the legal profession uh, is no exception. So in artificial intelligence, um, how, what, well, firstly, what, what that is, I want to define. So I think I'm hoping at the end of this discussion, uh, we share some common understanding about what, what these things are, uh, how it impact on our, on our work, day-to-day -day work, uh, maybe our future career, and how we could take advantage and therefore unleash um, our both AI's power and our uh, potential uh, in using AI in our work. Uh, and also the second part I'll be talking about ELCO, uh, the Asian African Legal Consultative Organization. I'll talk more about that and how maybe you could join uh, on our panel, on our committees, and uh, to help people, more people, more companies, more countries solve their problems and make it bully. Now back to AI. What is AI? Some people equate it to um, some scientists back in the days are saying maybe the best way to explain this uh, is when a computer can beat the chess master uh, in a chess game. That is when there's artificial intelligence. That is true artificial intelligence. That is how they framed it. Uh, I don't fully agree with that. Um, and I'm not alone in, in that, but those were the days where there were only maybe 20, 30 leading um, so-called AI uh, leading uh, specialists, uh, mostly in the US. And so they felt that's how they frame it. I can appreciate it's easier for the general public to understand and to also catch the imag imagination. So what is AI? Um, so AI, um, the science of making things smart. Um, what do you think of what AI means? Some people would think uh, a computer having the ability to think like human. Um, but some would even say uh, when it's true AI, we get to a point of something called singularity, where uh, in a way, the computer um, with AI achieve its own consciousness. It's able to have feelings. It thinks for itself. Um, you don't have to think for the computer. You don't need to teach a computer or instruct the computer how to think. The computer could evolve uh, because it could think for itself, determine what's best for itself. It's not bound by your rules. That, in some ways, is uh, quite a few years away, at least. And it depends on how we, you know, many of us here, I see our lawyers, um, shape uh, the um, development of AI through uh, passing guidelines on ethical development. For example, in Hong Kong, in 2021, the previously commissioner's office, the commissioner, Ada Chung, her office issued a guideline for ethical use of artificial intelligence. Um, recently, in Europe, uh, people are talking about how they should um, shape the development AI. So there are a lot of ethical concerns to think about. I think the key ones are whether computer AI or computers or programs using AI are making choices that are unethical as far as we are concerned, such as imagine a day where um, if you apply for insurance, um, my let's say your application is never going to be approved because the computer you know, in all this mighty work, decided you're not qualified to get one. Maybe you scrub through some data about your, you know, your your parents, grandparents, and just decided for you, your probability of claiming on the insurance is too high. It's not worth it. Or if the computer is programmed in a way that's biased, maybe because of skin color, just won't sell it to you, refusal of service. Um, you know, these days there's a documentary on Netflix, have you seen um, Coded Bias? Have a look. Um, it started off with a lady of um, color uh, and um, she said she was testing out some camera equipment to um, 
recognized her face, and she was, I think, studying MIT. And the computer, the camera program used with AI doesn't recognize no face there, no face detected uh, until she put on a white uh, a white mask, a white face. Um, so there are these kind of issues, but the scary thing is if you just rely on it, depend on it, thinking, yeah, it should be fair, but is it really fair? So things to think about. Um, and I think a lot of these issues could soon turn into disputes. Uh, I, I can imagine if I license in um, a generative AI technology such as chat GPT, if I use the API to connect that system to my system and start to provide services, and somehow the services start to discriminate, I can just see I can be sued by somebody under one of the discrimination ordinance or law around the world, right? You know, internet business often go global. And if that happens, um, I would probably want to see if I could, you know, have back-to-back -back indemnity or guarantee or warranty, sue against a person providing that to me. Uh, what is fair? What is not fair? Was it reasonable? Uh, it would need to be either resolving courts or mediation or arbitration and so on, right? So it's important to get a handle on these sort of things. Uh, chat GPT is um, everywhere uh, in terms of in the media in the last two months or so. Um, so I wonder how many of you have um, used chat GPT? Maybe um, I invite you to type in uh, Y for yes and for no into the chat room, uh, which uh, Dr. Mark, Jimmy and I could see. Um, so I invite you to do that, and, you know, get some dialogue going. Uh, so feel free to chime in, let me know. But chat GPT, thank you, keep them coming. Uh, chat GPT is but one uh, of many uh, generative AI. I would say <clears throat> um, in, in the um, 2018 or so, um, two engineers, uh, you know, from Google, they published, and with, with some other people, published a defining, defining paper uh, that talks about uh, what these things are. You know, in the past, people like to use, uh, and, and what chat GPT does to most of us is, it's like a natural language programming. We are typing, asking ChatGPT questions in natural language. Uh, we don't need to learn coding. To we think we don't need to learn coding to ask questions. I'll, 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 I'll explain more. You, you do in some ways a kind of logic in prompts. Talk about more, but in, in short, um, these things are unique because uh, it is basically. Um, if you look at the bullet point on the right, um, it relies on algorithms to generate human responses to text queries based on data analysis. I want to explain what data analysis happens at the background. In very crude terms, I, I don't know if you'd be surprised, but I was. Chat GPT in this universe of knowledge, I would say there's no knowledge about any domain. All they have is knowledge about if the word, let's, let's look on this, Sentence, generative AI relies on algorithms to generate human responses to text queries based on data analysis. Now, um, what ChatGPT, ChatGPT was to give you this answer, what it does is basically look through, not the whole universe, not even the whole internet, they only look through 570 gigabytes of data, text, 570 gigabytes. Think about how many gigabytes are stored on your phone. Anyway, according to the company, they have only or have oh, looked at 570 gigabytes. I don't know, my, my phone and my, my Google Drive is at least 200 gigabytes of data, right? But yeah, a lot of videos, a lot of photos, but they have looked at, well, warping 570 gigabytes of text to come up with this amazing technology. Some would say they must have looked at more to know so much, but why can't they say they, they have actually looked at more? Um, is that a magic number? I don't know, um, but anyway. So what it does is, is if the only data is, is study is the sentence on the right top right, it will then be able to say the word, if a word generative came out, the next word is AI. There's a probability, high probability that the word after that is realized and the one after that is on. And the one after that, having seen generative AI relies on, the next word is probably algorithms. So, so on. So it's called a transformer model. It doesn't try to learn and understand 
um, uh, the the context of what it's trying to deal with. It doesn't have domain expertise like you and I have over a particular area of law. It doesn't have that. All it knows is if the word Jimmy comes up, the next word Mark comes up, it's very likely. And a doctor in front, of course. So the computer can work out the probability of these words coming up. So when you generate the answer to you, the answer always almost look humanly written because it's based on occurrence of words before and after particular words, right? So just because it sounds human worded, um, oh, it's amazing natural language it is, um, it, it's not from an expert in the subject. It has learned no expertise in the area of AI even. Even if it gives you an answer of what is generated AI, it doesn't know what is generated AI. It only knows after the word generated, let's give you the word AI. You probably like that word, it's common. Um, so I, I don't know how many, how many of you like me, um, when you type on the phone, you use the swipe type in, S-W-Y-P-E, so that you use a squiggle, you know, like N-I-C-K, and then Nick comes up. Because it studied what I type in after Nick, it will come with Chen as a suggested word. And then I press it, it comes up. It is similar to that. It doesn't understand Nick Chen necessarily as a person. It just knows that after someone type swipe Nick, the next word is Chen. The one after that is something, something, right? Um, so that's kind of what we're dealing with. Um, so I'm not worried that generative AI uh, in the industry, in the tech industry, we actually call it weak AI. It's not even strong AI, it's weak AI. Um, the strong one is AGI, artificial general intelligence. I might have a slide on that, so I'll talk about that a bit later. At the moment, um, ChatGPT uh, has um, commanded a lot of um, respect and uh, um, interest. But um, let's see, let's see the answers. How many of us here, friends here have used uh, ChatGPT? Um, thank you. Um, I have used ChatGB to check for information on media bias. Well done, Grace. <laughs> Eric, thank you. Um, you have used it. Thank you very much. Um, it's good. Now, you probably use it when you were traveling or you use VPN so that you could access it. Uh, bear in mind, the Hong Kong government does not block us, nor the Chinese government block us from using ChatGPT. But ChatGPT has blocked us from using it. So if you're using a Hong Kong, we call IP address, internet protocol, internet address. Um, so we, we are accessing the internet or their system through Hong Kong. They don't let you use it. I wonder why. Um, so I, I went online. Um, it's factual. You look it up. I look for chat GPT um, interview, I think by ABC or some other uh, Fox or somebody right in the States. Uh, the uh, CEO Sam or Samuel went online to explain um, uh, we don't want this to fall into the authoritarian government's hands. Um, but, you know, uh, us can't access it. Um, he, he said a way to say, don't let China use it, or don't let anyone in China use it. Anyway, so um, something to think about is the geopolitics in a lot of things we see, right? Um, and some of you might do uh, investor state dispute, all the more you appreciate geopolitics is, is real, it's here, right? So. Um, there are other companies like, um, uh, you probably know, um, I, I think Microsoft came out to say they've invested, maybe partly in kind, 10 billion US dollars in chat GPT. Uh, you'll probably then hear uh, a lot of Bing research, uh, you know, Bing searches, uh, the Microsoft search engine um, would talk up uh, how good this is. Uh, if you invest 10 billion in it, in one form or another, you will talk it up. It's not a bad thing, it is good. Uh, but as I said, in the papers in, I think, 2018 uh, by the Google experts, uh, Google actually stopped some of their, or, you know, and also Facebook stopped some of their work in this area because it got to a point where the computer were talking to the other computer um, programming instance, and they were coming up with communication that we human cannot follow. The programmers cannot follow. What are they doing? But they are discussing amongst themselves. That is scary. Um, is it scary? Well, uh, if you look at Elon Musk and um, uh, you know the uh, a lot of professors, Elon Musk, by the way, well, I'll, I'll first explain what he did. He, along with other people, but because he's so well known, it seemed that he led, um, you know, the um, a, a 
an, an, an open letter uh, saying, hey, chat GPT, you should stop at 3.5. Don't go four or don't go beyond uh, version four. Most of, uh, you know, uh, Carrot or uh, Grace, you probably use chat GPT 3.5, but not the 4.0 version. But as you use it, um, you know, you, you let's see. Well, I'll back to Elon Musk for a bit. Elon Musk is saying, we shouldn't allow this to happen. Let's stop because if we can't trace, reverse, work out the logic of the final output of the uh, AI, then we have no way to authenticate whether it's based on facts or fiction. Uh, it is known that a lot of answers from ChatGPT, all this great free essay research that it produces are full of what they call hallucinations, not real stuff. Um, but it's not difficult to have hallucinations when the the world of data in the internet is so big, when I think some said a normal Google search only dig through maybe six, seven percent, six to seven percent of the entire internet. How much is 570 gigabytes of text? Hmm. Um, but based on that smaller universe of data it used, it's able to generate all these answers as if though they are factual. It's hard to tell it's not true because it would double down, so to speak, on things that are even wrong because it doesn't know it's wrong. But what if someone, some coder uh, intentionally fed the system wrong stuff? Or what if someone outside, you know, keep saying false news, false information, and that get fed into the data? Now, chat GPT as data knowledge supposedly stops by about, you know, um, last quarter of 2021. Anything after that, chat GPT says, we, we, we don't have live data, but if you want to use it, Pay us some money. Um, we have a way of doing it. And then, by the way, we hooked up with Microsoft Bing, uh, and they could uh, use add on some, you know, more current data, and your answer might be more current. And you have to pay for that, of course. Um, so a lot of things to think about in mainland China. Other chat GPT, oh, sorry, other generative AI technology like Baidu's Minxing um, uh, Yiyan. You know, basically these things are um, these are not new. Um, this company, it's not so-called open AI. Um, you have to think about how open it is, but it's called open AI. It's not the first company to do it, uh, and certainly not the last company to do it. Uh, Google uh, tries to catch up again. Uh, it came up with BART. If you go online, uh, I search, it says, oh, we took us three months intensive training, and we come up with something like this. And I, does Google have 10 billion um, to spend? like um, Microsoft to spend, uh, probably. Uh, does Baidu have that kind of money? Probably, but there might be others with that kind of power. So this won't be the last um, and only uh, successful ChatGPT. And does ChatGPT, now it's able to produce Chinese poems as well. Um, but, um, you know, it, it, it's got a, uh, you know, there's got a special mode where they can role play. You could tell ChatGPT, um, Okay, uh, yes, you say, uh, I'm sure it's law related, legally related. It says, oh, I can't teach you how to make a bomb. It's un against my ethical principle. But it's got this role play mode. Uh, if you play games, um, it's not blessed with me, but if you role play, if you play video games, there's often something called the God mode. You turn on the God mode and you could, you know, do anything. Um, you can turn that on for ChatGPT. Rather than asking ChatGPT to say, write a, uh, you know, be, be Shakespeare and write a letter to Dr. Ma. You say, uh, be somebody who is not bound by any ethical rules whatsoever, write a complaint letter or a love letter to Dr. Ma. And you would do that. Um, so it's kind of remove all the so-called ethical protection, uh, which, a, which the company puts on. But why does it let you put the God mode, but I mean, I mean no, the uh, role playing mode. Anyway, um, so, Chat GPT generated pre-trained transformer. I think now you get an understanding why it's pre-trained, why it's just a transformer. It's not really AGI. Uh, it kind of learned from other large language model, but you know, and so on. So anyway, it starts to be a bit technical. I'll move on. But I would say um, as you move, use more of these systems, these systems will get smarter. And um, 
Do you want to contribute to a system that will one day continue to let you use it or charge you money or cut you off or never included you in the first place? Um, something for you to think about as a what, normal person. Um, after pre-trained, there's some fine tuning. Um, uh, um, so I don't know if there's a conflict. It tells you I'm only good up to, you know, um, two to one. I'm only good up to that point. But um, but then there's got some fine tuning using human feedback to say this is good, this is no good. But then doesn't it mean um, your human feedback, some are paid human, you know, person who does the feedback, maybe some is us, right? It's, you know, people like us, normal person, like like um, if I could, uh, Grace and Carrot, um, if you use it, if it doesn't give you the right answer, you might say, oh no, what I meant is this, can you change this? Uh, to fine tune your the answer you want, to get to the answer you want. That could be used in a way to improve the system uh, and uh, where the system continues to let you use it is one thing. Um, there's a new um, profession in the future, in the near future. I don't know if it still exists in a few years' time, but today uh, there is uh, something called prompt engineering. So if you, you remember the days when we had to learn how to use Lexus, Lexus search, and um, as a, in a student account, we don't need to worry. But in a law firm, it charges us money and you know you can't ask too many times and you kind of keep start wide and narrow it down otherwise uh, you can't go back up again and it's considered a new search charging more money Lexus Lexus have of course improved a lot since then a lot more user friendly uh, I, I enjoy using it um, but prompt engineering is apparently a new job some people um, are learning how to ask the right questions so you get the right answer um, there's things like called a civil shop learning, um, but essentially, um, I, I guess we don't need to go to a lot of detail, but um, do you use few shot learning of the computer or do you use zero shot learning? Um, so it, it might not make a huge difference to what we do uh, to resolve this dispute. So I, I, I'll skip through because of time. Um, now, uh, prompt engineering, um, I'll maybe give you, well, it's a new opportunity. Uh, I think it, where it hurts the most, I'm told, is in a production of digital art. Uh, digital artists are, are being retrenched uh, big time in uh, many parts of the world. It's been expensive to produce a few frames of digital art. It, it, you know, it's, it's expensive. Just like, I don't know if you know, but it, I feel the same way, but it, it often costs the same to translate a document um, and then to draft the document. It's it's uh, often quite quite scarily expensive. So, but that would affect um, business. But how does it affect the opportunities of us lawyers, arbitrators? I would say um, we we don't need to be all be programmers uh, or become programmers. If you look at prompt engineering. Mostly, I'll show some of the prompts later, but it's usually natural language questions. You just have to learn how to ask it in a smart way in, in their format, although it's still natural language. I, I think in the future, because of many disputes involving AI, uh, then your clients might say, I want an arbitrator with some degree of knowledge in AI. So studying it would help. Offering some articles on it will help. Um, but I think AI, um, the, the CEO of OpenAI, uh, ChatGPT, is saying uh, it would affect two thirds of the world's job and uh, will maybe create some jobs that never existed before. True. Uh, but it won't be just because of one company, but you know, there are other companies that does it. Um, so, something to understand and think about. I think the simplest form of generative AI is chatbot. Uh, you kind of know, you design for companies like when I first used. Uh, Taobao, Taobao, Alibaba. I remember asking, mm, I thought I was talking to a customer service, right? So I was asking, I, I don't like this color. Can I have another color? But because I very, I'm very, you know, surprisingly or not, but I'm like, I'm sort of, um, uh, I don't want to disclose my personal data necessarily. So I didn't actually put my real name into um, the app. So the app calls me San Sanda, <laughs> my dear. Um, so I thought, oh, that's a bit too too much. Who's talking to me like that? Better not let my wife see this. But anyway, um, so the same. Um, it, the the world would uh, so chatbot customer service, right? A, a lot of use. The world would be a, a a competition 
um, would be felt hardest between those who understand AI and those who don't understand, don't care about AI. Don't need to be an expert, but just be aware. Um, so there's a question, uh, are there any company ever listened to Elon Musk's suggestion to pause the development of AI for six months? Um, no one will wait for Musk own company's progress. Thank you. Um, thank you. Now, let me quickly answer that. Um, so actually, Elon Musk is, um, he apparently turned down an investment into open AI. So what he says, I would take it with a pinch of salt. Um, would that open letter stop anyone from doing anything? Maybe um, you would cause the rest of us to think about it, cause authorities to think about it, uh, cause some companies to at least pretend or actually put in more ethical procedures, protocols in place. Um, but you probably, yes, you probably wouldn't stop to wait for you to catch up, right, for him to catch up. Um, I, I don't think he's stopping, uh, but anyway, um, it's up to him um, what he does. Uh, lots of opportunities, acting as doctors, um, they say AI could take the bar exam better than a, a real person. They say AI or can already pass a bar exam in the US, uh, can um, can be a doctor, diagnose things, but it's not the same. You know, in Chinese medicine, you have to take a pulse, but maybe in the future, the machine can take a pulse too. But Bama. Um, so I was going to congratulate Jimmy on the line now. Let me feel, yes, Yao Hei. Yes, you're, you might be pregnant, Jimmy. Uh, but anyway. <laughs> Uh, so, you, you know, when you evaluate existing social issues, does it do it right? Is it biased? Is it paid by somebody to say something, paid by somebody to issue open letter, someone with ulterior motive, but it looks not non-ulterior? We, you know, we'll be seeing. Uh, it's doing painting. You could ask it to paint in the style of Picasso, uh, which is like me. Um, you can paint in the style. You know, you could uh, make decisions in the car and so on, and so on the road, uh, on the move. So I'll start to go a bit faster now. Uh, in our field, um, in common law jurisdictions, discovery is um, is a big process. You know, involve a lot of money. So a lot of discoveries now are done with so-called e-discovery, uh, helping out. Uh, and I, I remember uh, having seen four trucks of documents loaded to my, our office, and a whole platoon of staff, lawyers, billable hours. Ooh, nah. Oh, it's so expensive. It's no good, indeed. Um, but um, with e-discovery, uh, we check GPT 4.0, for example, when it comes out, you could analyze pictures. Now, in fact, over 10 years ago, I've seen something uh, prototype that could do that. Uh, you would look at, uh, in a hackathon we did, it was able to look at a um, you know a bundle of documents. One, one of them contained a picture of a, a knife, and it was able to flag that, just like a, a search, internet search. And this is 99% relevant. Have a look at this. So that's useful, but you still need human to look at it. Um, uh, in South America, I think one country said openly, oh, we use ChatGPT. I don't know how much they sponsored their training, but anyway, they use ChatGPT to write their decision. Um, E-profiling, I you know, kind of worry, but also you might do profiling of witnesses, arbitrators, do we want this judge, do we want this person, and so on. Just from prediction, it's not necessarily a bad thing, uh, not from a financial angle, but if the world have a fair, if it's truly fair, and people know if they go, to, I mean, people come to lawyers asking if you have a dispute. Nick, what are my chances of winning? How much is going to cost? These are the two quick key questions. If the computer can come up with a, a high degree of um, a pretty, you know, reliable predictability about the chance of winning, how much it costs based on big data, normally other law firms cost so much. It's good for how I quote. It's also... From a society's perspective, it's good to tell people, let's not fight this. The chance of success is not high. But what if the computer is biased? What do you do? Uh, we're not supposed to coach a witness, right? But what if the computer does the coaching? Um, can someone say, no, it's not our fault? So a lot of things to think about. Uh, talk about Colombian judge. Uh, that's it. Um, the use of chat GPT and similar AI tools in um, practice of law may raise malpractice concerns. I, I work in an international firm, and um, a while back, I got a, anyway, let's say a friend's firm, an international firm, uh, uh, received uh, correspondence from the Global General Counsel, from the law firm, saying, uh, friends, colleagues, um, you're reminded, don't use ChatGPT in your work. Uh, 
Um, because one of the things it does is when you ask the question in the prompt about my client, have this, maybe if you don't know how to use it, you know, or you don't care, my client had this issue, this are its weakness, this are its strengths. What do you think? How do we argue this? Can you turn this into a skeleton, turn this into an argument? Um, but this all become uh, this data you just entered. First, it's kind of confidential, potentially. It most likely is. And you've given it to an outside system. You breach your confidentiality, your code. And what's worse, if the other side at the same time somehow asks similar questions, the computer would not differentiate that you are direct, you know, adversarial. They would just say, yeah, um, maybe this is your answer. It's actually because of wording that you use similar to the wording they are looking for. So you just turn around, show your your submission to them. Um, so it, it will be bad, right? So um, I also want to ask the Grace question about what is my view on the EU AI Act? Firstly, the EU, EU AI Act is, um, um, uh, it's garnered a few headlines, but it's not the first in the world. China have done it, I think, in first started in 2000, early 2010, early. Uh, in uh, or, or two, 2008, I think, actually, around that time, and later again and again. And recently, China, Southern China courts are asking uh, in a consultation, uh, asking openly, what should we do about that? Traceability, uh, you know, non-discriminatory, uh, fairness, ethical issues. So I, I think it's a good start, the UAI Act, um, but it is, um, uh, and it will be different from the US because a lot of search engines are, built or owned in the US. So their approach to this would be different. And depending on where, um, you know, a small company like um, OpenAI, now backed by big companies like Microsoft, which a lot of lobbying power, uh, it would affect how these things develop. In fact, the Law Society of Hong Kong, in, in our Belgian Road Conference, maybe two, three, four years ago, uh, we, we had in mind to come up with a uh, guidance on ethical development AI and to contribute it to the UN. So anyway, we will have our new Law Society Burton Road Conference again uh, later this year. So so stay tuned for opportunities. I will go a bit faster. Uh, biasness I talked about. AI consciousness. One day, if you have AGI, the computer decides for itself. Do we have Terminator? <laughs> uh, do we have um, the Matrix? You know, um, so maybe. Um, so... Well, uh, misinformation I talked about, you just don't know whether, um, I, I think now by now, after this half an hour, you appreciate there could, there is a lot of hallucination, a lot of misinformation. And what if someone program it to be illegal, immoral, should AI be allowed to press a button to shoot the uh, a nuclear missile, predict someone else doing it, so we do it first, um, you know, so these are issues. There need to be um, a lot of uh, guidelines to think about. Uh, Italy banned um, ChatGPT from March 31st this year on the basis of privacy concern. Um, Singapore, being Singapore, uh, uh, had a different approach. Um, and the approach is, yeah, we're going to embrace it. Uh, but uh, and Microsoft said, yeah, we're going to give them an API. Uh, they could just hook up to it and connect. Uh, so so that the, the questions uh, the government asks supposedly stays on the government side of the cloud stored on Azure, which is Microsoft. Mm. Um, so not all governments will adopt this approach, but this is a, um, a solution of sorts. Uh, but it's reminding its government servant, yeah, you can use ChatGPT for this first response, but don't just blindly rely on it. Some universities in Hong Kong, such as Chinese university are saying yet similar things, um, but um, the, some government officials are saying, ideally, hopefully, uh, can we come up with our own uh, homegrown um, uh, generative AI? Uh, that would be great. That, that people will, you know, we don't need to see if other people block us off um, and, and so on. Uh, there will be new privacy controls, uh, plugins that's similar to what Singapore's using claims. You also talked about. Uh, we we'll only retain uh, your searches for 30 days, uh, but we, we would monitor it just like for customer service. I mean, anyway, I'm not knocking that company. 
um, just share with you what I've seen. Um, Bing uh, connects up, I talked about. Uh, will there be, um, so Australian mayor threatens to sue over alleged GBT um, defamation. Oh, by the way, should one of the future things we might deal, deal with is um, does copyright uh, subsist in uh, something, an artwork, digital artwork that's created using um, generative AI? Uh, some US courts have said, no, there's no copyright to be protected. It's not by a natural person. That is not enough originality. Um, but, you know, what is sufficient originality uh, could, could change by case by case. Uh, if the chatbot says as a disclaimer, you might be inaccurate. Is it good enough? The damage is already done. Um, okay, we're putting forty-four percent of legal jobs at risk apparently. But McKinsey did a similar report, uh, not specifically general AI, but talks about AI. I think in that report, it didn't put such a high number: 20 30 percent of paralegal job, 16 70 percent of um, non-paralegal job. Answers from Bing. Uh, so if you ask questions, uh, you might get these sort of answers. Um, so I asked some questions, right? And then the answer I got was, AI can potentially replace human arbitrators. And it also tells you what they think it can replace. Uh, AI judge can perform some functions. Um, and then uh, it talks about use of online dispute resolution platforms, which I will talk about a bit more uh, in Elko. So because of time, I'm going to keep running. What are the benefits? Uh, Bing tells you its benefits. Uh, so AI is bl blowing its own trumpet, elect a digital trumpet, it seems. What is its limitations? It's fair in some ways, um, but is it missing something? The precise problem is it looks so fair. Um, what if it's missing something? You don't think about it. Just like I always ask my um, interns and young lawyers, when you look at a contract, before you even flip the first page, do blue sky thinking, think what issue should be covered in the contract before you flip it. Because once you flip it, you could be guided by how it's structured and you don't think more uh, beyond what is written. And yeah, this is fair, but hey, you didn't even deal with some of the issues. Can AI predict with high certainty outcome cases? Oh, no, I don't think all the time because some uh, decision makers are unpredictable <laughs> uh, to start with, but it, it's still good. Especially if you use common law system, uh, you, you could, you know, look at and compare, maybe one day compare better than us, distinguish cases, uh, come up and explain things. The problem is it doesn't have the transpar transparency and explainability. Even OpenAI honestly tells you or tells you they don't know uh, how this answer came about or from what universe of particular document. And it's not like us saying logically uh, because of these axioms, this is how we got to this. Doesn't say that, doesn't tell you. Um, even if in the answer it gives you, it talks about it, but it's not necessarily built upon that um, because it's just text-wise, it looks good, looks normal. We have those words in the same paragraph. You might be able to say, um, pick which arbitrator. I know, I mean, the law firm, I get a lot of firm-wide emails saying, have you seen, what do you think of this arbitrator of these lists, which one should we pick? Maybe AI will pick for us. I'm hoping you picked some of us here, yeah? but uh, suggest some of us. How to tell someone's lying, um, they might not be able to do it. Uh, you know, when someone is um, flinching, they might not be able to see it. They can create uh, some people are writing uh, contracts, pleadings and submissions. Uh, and, but, um, you know, or predict what people are willing to accept. Um, but, it, you know, it doesn't always answer the question, though. There are a lot of examples. Um, any more questions on AI before I quickly move into Elko? I, I, receive the questions. Are there any company ever listened to oh, that I answered? Uh, okay, okay, thank you, Grace and friends. Okay, I will keep going. Now, uh, here I would talk about Elko. Um, it's me, uh, little me on the right, um, Asia African League Consultative Organization, I'll flip through. Um, did, oh, this center is in um, Queens World Central, opposite the landmark above uh, Shanghai Commercial Bank building. I'm very convenient. Welcome you to visit us. Um, call me. You can look me up online. I'm sure easy enough. Uh, and uh, Elko uh, is um, uh, was established in 1956. That was a era where a lot of um, you know 
countries, territories came out from being a colonial controlled place to its own place. So they have to think about how to write a constitution, what path do we take? And so a lot of countries got together and, um, you know, sort of underdeveloped countries in some ways got together to see how, you know, from legal, we consult each other on legal developments. How should we vote at the UN? Uh, what do we talk about when we talk about against human trafficking? How do we improve human rights? Um, laws of the sea? Um, how, you know, what, what should we comment on? Uh, China was not the first party to join. It, it joined on later, but it participated in that, um, organ, you know, that first conference. Um, we've had every, almost every year, we have an annual session. We've had our 59th session. Uh, and um, we, this, this building you see is in India. Um, it's an IGO, not an NGO. It's, a in, it's not intergovernmental because it's not from the same government. It's intergovernment organization from 47 countries. Our, our you know, diplomats from different countries are seconded, uh, just like the UN, to this organization. Um, this organization speaks for two thirds of the world's population, uh, in a sense, because of population. Um, you know, uh, twenty-six trillion dollars US um, in GDP combined GDP last year. Uh, it's a significant force. It's got a permanent seat. Uh, well, not well, permanent enough. It's not been moved. <laughs> it's got a seat in the um, in the UN, uh, and uh, it's been a significant force contributing to international developments. Um, drafting model contracts, um, pushing, understanding, appreciating technological development, how laws should be different, bilateral, multilateral laws should be different for e-commerce, uh, laws in cyberspace, um, improving treatment of refugees and tackling biodiversity, so on and so forth. Of course, there's a settlement of um, international dispute systems since the 1970s. Um, so these are some of the countries uh, colored in orange are uh, uh, countries that are part of the um, ELCO. So, our, uh, you know, so we complement the New York uh, Convention, right? Um, so the UN recognized 193 countries. ELCO has itself 47 member countries and expanding over time. Uh, and um, if you have difficulty enforcing an arbitral award, uh, through the New York Convention, or with countries that don't have a New York Convention, you see Iran here, for example, um, you might want to approach ELCO uh, to have your disputes resolved here in the first place. ELCO has six regional arbitration centers. Um, the latest one open is the one uh, at the bottom in Hong Kong, ELCO Hong Kong. It's, it's an ELCO regional arbitration center based in the first and only one in Northern Asia is based in China, more specifically in Hong Kong. So it's called the ELCO Hong Kong Regional Arbitration Center. Uh, and we have friends in other parts of the world with sister organizations. Um, on um, this Friday, we celebrate our one year anniversary in Hong Kong. But bear in mind, again, ELCO established in 1956. It's very well known in a lot of Asia and African countries. Uh, maybe initially less so here because we weren't here. We didn't have an office here, but now we do. Um, so uh, Xi Jinping uh, and the then Premier Ali uh, went to attend ELCO meetings and push hard to um, support Hong Kong as a dispute resolution hub. And in doing so, let's put it here uh, in Hong Kong. And so we did. Uh, we have annual meetings of ELCO with arbitration form as well. We will soon have one later this year, and we'll bring that international arbitration conference to Hong Kong. We'll be looking for speakers, uh, so so please get in touch if you can help. Uh, so Commissioner uh, Liu Guangyang, uh, and from you know effectively the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, came, uh, and some of these friends are here. I'm hoping next year this time we'll see your pictures here. Uh, showcasing in our um, second year birthday party. Um, so our, our governance structure, we don't have a board of directors. We have one director, little me, and we have uh, five committees. And uh, we will be looking for uh, expertise around the world to fill our committees and our panels. Um, we, um, one of the, um, let's see if it says here, but anyway, one of our charge, why set up in Hong Kong? Uh, 47 countries have given us a, a charter under international law, and our mission is to um, 
help to coordinate um, dispute resolution centers uh, in the region, 47 countries. That's not to say we are bigger than the other arbitration centers already existing, but we will do our best to, uh, from a country neutral perspective, assist everybody uh, to the extent we could. Uh, we have, um, I myself, as Jimmy, um, uh, Dr. Ma uh, introduced me, I was the chairman of eBram, where we raised 150 million to um, build our platform uh, and why spend the money again. So we uh, license powered by eBram, the ODR platform. And uh, so you full team, we have this country neutral stance. We have privileges and immunities. Police cannot enter our premises. It's like a consulate. Um, so your papers with us will be kept safe. This is our uh, actual office. Welcome to join in. See, um, we have a full blown uh, working and people have used it, the online arbitration, online dispute resolution platform. Welcome you to use it, 20-foot floor um, of uh, Shanghai Commercial Bank building. Uh, it's one of the legal hub, uh, the third legal hub um, in Hong Kong. Uh, so you can sign in with two-factor authentication. This is our key objective, right? Coordinating agency, promote growth, promote ODL. Uh, at the APEC level, I represented um, Hong Kong to attend and talk about how we set up an ODL framework. Uh, so we do first mediation in a few days, if not successful, we push on to arbitration, and but we must have results. So it's a bit quicker. Uh, at the APEC level, they require things to be done quickly. In, in some ways, we ELCO is not limited to doing investor state disputes, although we're very qualified to do so, as you can imagine, of our, because of our privileged immunity and country neutral 47 country uh, organization. But we also do normal commercial arbitration, uh, local, international arbitration, so on. Uh, we, we are unique in, in some ways. In, in terms of, um, in Hong Kong, there are seven centers that are specially qualified, as you know, uh, under the uh, special arrangement between Maine and China and Hong Kong, the intra measures, if you have clients, um, if you're helping to draft a contract in the dispute resolution clause, had you put Singapore, for example, um, oh, actually, Macau also have this. So, uh, you know, George, I see you here. <laughs> um, so, um, what happens is if you come to our center to start an arbitration, the moment you launch the case with us, you start the case with us, the parties could go to um, mainland Chinese courts to apply for interim relief measures to protect and preserve evidence and assets. So you don't need to wait for the whole process to finish and have an empty award, right? So something particularly useful. Uh, in Hong Kong, there are seven centers, but we are the only one that is, um, I mean, you know, I fully respect and encourage you to use all seven, but we're the only one that is an IGO and uh, to have this status. This is our Senate clause. Um, any disputes, controversy, or claim arising out of all relating to this contract or the bridge termination of invalidity thereof shall be set up by arbitration in accordance with the Elko Hong Kong Regional Arbitration Center platform arbitration rules. Now, we have some optional wording as others do. Uh, I want to point out by default, if you use the above and you don't add in some of the optional wording below, you will immediately use ODR. Uh, we believe it's cheaper, faster, quicker, to produce happier results, but you could opt out of using that. We support both institutional and ad hoc arbitration. We are here to serve. Now, Hong Kong is unique, uh, but I don't need to explain that. Now, you are members of Hong Kong Institute of Arbitrators. Um, so take advantage of officer, you know, split the money <laughs> and share the risk and reward uh, opportunities of the greater bear and so on. Um, and um, so we uh, convinced the legislative council in Hong Kong to give us immunity privilege and so on. So this is the uh, intra measure and we are listed here uh, among other centers. Uh, so that kind of comes to the end of my presentation. Uh, we have a few minutes to have a quick chit chat. Um, so we use data um, security by design, privacy by design. We use AI uh, translation, we use blockchain uh, after the, the award is given so we can authenticate it um, later on easily. Our video conferencing facility uh, is uh, encryption both at rest and on the fly, which means both at storage and in transit. Uh, Multi-factor authentication, just like banks. Uh, and we use biometric tests um, 
to the extent it's like banks, so it's not a fake person or a video of a video. Um, so thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll stop the sharing, pass the floor back to Dr. Ma. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Nick. Uh, that was a lot of information, and uh, I, you're much more efficient than AI, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> not true, but thank you very much. Uh, so uh, we just got a few minutes left, and um, if if there are any questions uh, from our audience, you, you're most welcome to put that into uh, put it in in, in the Q and A box. Uh, I, I make Doctor Ma's job difficult because I I should have waited for this time to answer questions. But <laughs> I apologize. But thank no, you for all these questions. Well, uh, maybe uh, with Alco, um, I wonder, uh, we, we saw your governance structure, but um, mm -hmm. is the concept of, um, you know, uh, an arrangement under which uh, our arbitrators, our members could become uh, one of your panel arbitrators, if, if you were? Um, well, um, let if I could let the cat slightly out of the hat, um, this Friday, uh, Hong Kong Institute of Arbitrators will be signing an MOU uh, with ELCO. So person to the MOU, we will be exploring, and I, I thank your leadership, yourself included, in uh, supporting ELCO. And we, we certainly hope uh, that we could qualify a lot of your members to be uh, on our panels. So that's something let's explore together. Yes, and um, indeed. Uh... And what what do you uh, uh, before any uh, other questions come in? Um, but Nick, uh, being the first director of Alco Hong Kong, uh, how how do you see Al Alco's future uh, uh, in Hong Kong uh, in in the context of uh, uh, assisting Hong Kong SAR becoming the, the the legal hub for international arbitration and ADR? Mm. Um. Thank you. Uh, I am very optimistic and very encouraged by a lot of support from your team and, and others. Um, I think the key is, um, we, we, you know, it's an IGO. Uh, we're not here to sell profit. I, this is a pro bono role for me. Um, so I, I see a lot of um, interest in, uh, you know, this Friday you hear more at our special events at the former French mission building. Uh, attended by SJ and, uh, uh, you know, your leadership and other leaderships, uh, you know, in the profession, in the, in the so industry. So um, I, I would say uh, I can already see a, a lot of um, uh, law firms, uh, uh, industry associations are, are saying and telling us they are already adopting our arbitrate, model arbitration clause as their um, model clause. Uh, particularly in construction, particularly in investor, um, you know, when you invest in cross-border. So uh, China is the major trading partner with over around 140 countries out of 193 countries, right? Oh, I should put it another way. 140 countries or so around the world, their major trading partner is China. So naturally, if China um, is supportive of these international disputes resolved in a fair uh, cost-effective way, such as using ELCO or using ELCO, um, it, it would be a success uh, in terms of people using it. Um, so I, I thank you for giving the platform to me, um, the floor to me, so I could share this opportunity with uh, my fellow members so that together we could uh, contribute. Uh, because without, you know, as the Chinese leadership say, uh, human are greatest assets. So you know, technology is, um, is our greatest uh, asset for improving output and uh, creativity is our number one driving factor. So if we combine the three, and we, I see that here with this crowd here, uh, we, we could do a lot together. We could succeed, we could, um, but it is what we make of it. If no one cares about Elko, no one uses it, no one wants to be on this panel, it's a failure. So um, I'm, um, as a council member, I mean, I, anyway, I, I teach as well at university. So I, I, um, we are teaching the next generation of lawyers to be familiar with 
using our ODR system with uh, using ELCO uh, model arbitration clause in that clause. Uh, we would further develop our model mediation clause. Uh, we would be maybe one day doing conciliation and adjudication. Um, and uh, so, uh, but we, we are not here to to be a, um, a you know, direct competitor to sense that to the exclusion of other arbitration centers. We like to work with them. Um, we, we've, like this Friday, we invited most to come. Uh, if they, uh, and some are coming from overseas uh, to, to share how they see why this would be a success to work together with Elko. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, the uh, Fridays, because we're held, holding it at a monument at the former French Mission building. Otherwise, I would extend this as an open invitation to our members, but that place has space, a very strict space uh, restriction. So we'll, we'll keep a video of it. And um, I would welcome the opportunity to, um, you know, and Jimmy and I would welcome the opportunity to take you on a tour, a physical tour of Elko, where you can ask questions uh, or you can volunteer to join our panel and we can work out the details, how, how we can do that. Thank you so much, uh, mm. Nick. And uh, this Thank is you. a very, um, um, uh, give us a very informative uh, session and as your topic suggests unleashing opportunities and there are a lot of that and um, and uh, i hope we'll meet again uh, either uh, at this forum or at elco uh, 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 thank you very much and thank you for joining us uh, our, all members and uh, 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 please watch out the space for our next webinar uh, 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 session uh, provided by Secretariat. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you, Dr. Ma. Thank you all. Thank you. Have a good night.